Good morning. Buona sifiwe. It's good to see you. And it's good to be seen by you. What a wonderful day that God has given to us to continue studying from his word, the word of life. Um, we had uh, come up to chapter two, the end of chapter two, two weeks ago, and we are gonna pick it up from there, chapter three, and see what the Lord has for us today. So if you're a visitor, you're visiting us for the first time, feel welcome, this is Calvary Chapel. We love visitors and we love the Bible. We love his word. We go through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. And this morning we find ourselves in Acts chapter three. So before we read God's word, let's ask for his blessings. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your grace bestowed upon us. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, and we thank you for your word that is here before us today, the word of life. Lord, we ask that as we read it publicly, as you have commanded us, that your spirit will cause us to understand and to receive that which you have for us this morning. So we ask that you would uh, fill us with understanding and open our eyes. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a copy of God's word, please read with me. Chapter three. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and anchor bones received strength. So he leaping and leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all those people who saw him walking and praising God, they knew him. Then they knew that he was he who was sat, he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's stop there for a moment and come back to this wonderful story of the miracle of healing this man who was lame. I guess it brings excitement for many people when we encounter on when we experience this kind of miracle, right? We, we want to see it with our eyes. We want to experience it. We want to be in a meeting where all these things are happening. And Jesus had told the disciples that greater things than these you should do in my name. And he had said also to them that when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. And that is the greatest call for them when Jesus was going back to heaven, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. 
And God, in his wisdom, he has provided many ways for his own people to witness about, um, especially the resurrection, to witness about the things that Jesus had done. And as we have studied it in the past, we saw that people were amazed when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. They are 120, and they say they were drunk. And right there when people were confused, in the middle of people's confusion, the apostle Peter expounded on the word of God brought the history and the prophecies and things that were spoken way back then and they were happening right in their eyes. And when the word of God went straight into their hearts, the Bible says 3,000 of them got born again one day and they baptized them. And the message was, it is not the elders, it is not the Pharisees, it is not the, the gods who crucified Jesus, it is you and I. It is our sin that took him to the cross. So don't look no farther, don't think it's the, it's the neighbor, it is this Gentiles, it is these other people who are not the Jewish people, they don't belong here, so they need Jesus, we don't. The message was very clear. Repent of your sins and be baptized. And that is also what we are going to see here, that God, the Holy Spirit, is making an event. He's making an event of healing and he's going to use that to bring the message of salvation to this people. This man, the Bible tells us that he was born lame. He's never walked a day in his life. They always ferry him to the, to the, the, the beautiful gate. Over 40 years, this man is sitting there begging. That is all he knows how to do, to beg people for alms. We were not even given his name. Just a certain man was born, lame from his mother's womb. They carried and laid him at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. This was something that he did customarily for him. He did it. Every time. We know from the scripture that people attended this worship service at different times. Some went in in the morning, nine, some at noon, and some at three. And many people, as maybe you have experienced and you have seen, when we have, you walk around town, there are always people who will beg for money, right? Many need people in town. Some are genuine, some are not. It is for you to figure out how to go about it. But you know, the, 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 the things that happen when we see people who are about to beg for money, what do we do? We try to avoid them at any cost. They come this way, I go this direction. Or I try to get busy. You know, maybe pull out my phone. I don't want to look at them. I don't want to see them. Because I know they, they want my money. <laughs> we try to avoid it at all cost. Think about this man who has been here from the morning. How many people avoided him that single day? Talking to people and people are just in and out of the temple, in and out, in and out. I don't know how many people stopped, or sometimes because of guilt, we just take, you know, 50 bob and throw it there, and you don't want problems, just give and go. This man was there 
asking for alms. He saw these two gentlemen and he asked them, perhaps there was a difference in these two gentlemen. Because these are people who were born again. They are followers of Jesus Christ. They have experienced the power of God. And I believe the joy of God is overflowing in their lives and you can see it. When Jesus went up to heaven, the Bible told us that they went back to Jerusalem rejoicing. They were happy. These were happy people. They have seen what God can do. They just preached and 3,000 got born again. And all these people, they are selling their properties and they are bringing the feet of the apostles. They are happy. Though they know it is not safe in Jerusalem because their lives are in danger, we are going to see it. With the religious leaders, they don't want them. But there is this joy in their lives that would be experienced. I don't know how many people locked eyes with them like, hey, can I get something? And they just walk right away. This man looked at them, they looked back, and they stood there. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. He's asked for alms. Peter said these words, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. His expectation was aroused because they took their time. They didn't move. He asked and they stood there. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. Perhaps he thought maybe they're going to give him more as compared to other people. Maybe they have a special gift for him. Maybe there's something. His expectation is growing up. But he does not know what to expect from this gentleman. So he gave them their attention. And this attention he gave to them, expecting something in return. As I'm giving you my attention, I am expecting something. Right? When, even when you talk to people like, hey, hey, look at me, talk. <laughs> talk to me back. You, you don't, if you greet people and they're looking the opposite direction, it's rude, right? It's very rude. <laughs> Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. And the immediate question is, what do you have then? <laughs> what do you have to offer? You don't have anything to offer to me. I can't go to work, man. Silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In a moment, there's confusion in this man's process. His thinking process. He doesn't have, but he wants to give. How can you give what you don't have? Do you want to rob someone to give me something? Or what are you thinking? So what I have... I give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. This man, no one has ever spoken to him like this all his life. Maybe people have prayed for him. Maybe they have given him enough. A lot of things have happened. He has a lot of experience when it comes to begging. He's a poor beggar. But he's never had such words come to him. And I think when this word came to him, he was like, 
What just happened? What do you have in the name of Jesus? I mean, I, I've never walked one day in my life. This is the gift that this man wants to give. And you realize as Peter is talking, he's saying, in the name of Jesus, not in my name, not in my goodness, not in what I'm able to give to you. Because silver and gold, that is what people give to you, and I have none of that. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. When Peter and John were coming to worship in the temple, this clearly tells us how this man were devoted. Though they're entering into a place of worship, they will meet thousands of people who are coming to worship. But the other question is, all these people who are coming to worship, do they know who they are coming to worship? Do they have a first-hand experience with the one they are coming to worship? Do they have a personal relationship with the one they are coming to worship? All of them are coming into the temple to worship. All devout men and women coming to worship. And when they were coming, do you think they knew that this was the day or this is the day that God said is going to heal this man? They didn't know. All they did, they just went out and they were always ready to give the account of the hope that they believe in. Given an account of what I believe in, of my conviction. And there the Lord will make a way for his name to be proclaimed. They, they didn't have time to figure it out, to buy anointing oils, to buy holy water, to, to, to whatever things... People do in preparation for this. They didn't have time for any of that. All they knew is God is able to work it out. We don't see it. We don't know how he's going to do it. But we believe he's going to work it out. Say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And when this man is still thinking about it, he's grabbing his right hand to help him stand. I wonder what was going on in his mind. What if? <laughs> what if it doesn't work? What if? What will people say? Because everyone, it's a busy traffic. What if it doesn't work? I don't think that was his option. Because he was deeply convicted that God was going to do it. Deeply convinced. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, the man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. A man who had never walked one day of his life, within a minute, all these things have happened. What kind of joy do you think this man is experiencing? I don't know if you recall the first day you got born again. The first day you experience the power of the Holy Spirit upon you, the amount of joy that overshadowed your heart, that you just wanted to be in the presence of God the whole time, right? It was amazing. For me, when I got born again, I just wanted to stay there. I didn't want to move. I was like the apostle, the Peter, James, and John, telling Jesus, hey, now that we have experienced this right here, we want to build houses. <laughs> we don't want to go out of this place. We want to 
experience this. We want to see Moses. We want to experience your presence right here. And Jesus says, boys, it's time to go and walk. <laughs> we can't stay here. What a joy for this man. What an experience for him. I don't know if you've, by chance, you know, digging the ground and trying to make pavements and by accident, you poke into a pipe, city pipe with water. You see how water rushes out? Poof! Water will always find its way out. A little crack, it comes out. This is the illustration that we are given with this man, that when he was lifted up, he gushed out. He jumped with joy, saying, well, this gift is more than silver and gold. I can now go and make them for myself. What a joy. I mean, for how long would you stay there? 50 more years? How long will you stay in your situation? When you have called on God and He's paying attention, but all you need is silver and gold. Are you in need of something else that is more eternal, something that is not temporal? And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. You see what God is doing. When such miracle happens, anything that God does, you can trace it and trace those people and know that it happened for sure. Not the miracles that we hear that all oh, the a thousand people were healed, but there's no record of them being sick before. And after that, we can't give an account. Really, that they, they, they really experienced the healing power of God. Because a lot of things, they are, they are stage managed. You come in this way and do this and do this and do this. A lot of counterfeit things are happening in the world. That is not to say that God is not healing people. He does even today, even right now, those who are calling upon his name. He does it. He's a merciful God. He's a faithful God. But then this was noticeable because this man has been there long enough. His face was imprinted in their eyeballs. They couldn't miss this person. When they saw him, immediately they knew that this was the man. How be it that he's walking? What happened? Now as the layman who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch which is called Solomon's. They were greatly amazed. And this is the beginning of the gospel that Peter preached again. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Why look to us like that? This is not our doing. <coughs> Now, 
He's trying to shift their attention, not to this man, but now he wants to preach the gospel. This assignment is done. You have seen what has happened, but I want you guys to think straight. This is nothing of our doing. It is not of how godly we are. It is not what we are able to do because people will think if you're godly enough, if you do this and this and this and this, now God can use you. That is not what he's saying. God can use whoever he wants. Those who are willing to be used of him, he will use them. We did make the man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead which we are witnesses. His audience were quite aware of this narrative. They knew the one God Yahweh the God of their forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And also, when they would hear the word Holy One, the Holy One of Israel, they would know for sure that they are talking about Yahweh. And he's telling them, and the one I'm mentioning to you, the one that you delivered up, even when Pilate was determined to let him go, you guys delivered him, and you know what you are crying for? You're crying for, for a murderer. You want someone of your own kind, <laughs> a thief like you, someone who resembles you. That is the one you want, disregarding the Holy One. What a pity. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and ask for a murderer to be granted to you, and kill the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, which we are witnesses. This is another subject that is troubling to the religious leaders, talking about resurrection of the dead. They had suppressed this information. They didn't want it to get to a lot of people, but it is getting out of hand because this man is preaching and preaching resurrection hard. And his name, through faith, in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him his perfect soundness in the presence of you all. In other words, he's saying, this miracle is undeniable. You know this man, you can trace his home, you can, you know, you know his family members, you know everyone about him, or everything about him, you know it. And God did that before your eyes. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. <laughs> Think about the audacity. Think about the, the audience, the kind of people they are, and the courage that this man is speaking with. It's like, you guys are very ignorant. <laughs> I know you did it in ignorance. I don't want to blame you for it. Because there is a way out. There is something that is better. I know you can be, you know, beating yourself down right now. 
But that is not the point. Live along the things that are of the past. There is a new page that is going to happen. But these things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophet, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. In other words, he's saying, if you guys also follow the prophecies, you are supposed to understand these things, that they are happening right in your eyes. You're seeing all these things happen. They are being fulfilled. Therefore, this is the message. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And this is our topic today, or this is our title of our message, the times of refreshing. These times, they don't come upon people who are not born again. They don't come upon people who have not repented of their sins. We might be full of ourselves, full of things. We, we think we have all the knowledge. We think we have read the Bible page to page and we know what it says. Yet in the inside, we are so dead, we are so dry. We don't know. Many of these people, they went for prayers. But their hearts were far away from Yahweh. And he's saying to them, there's a way out. And the way out is you repent your sins and be converted so that your sins will be taken away. So that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. A refreshing moment. You guys who have been born again, you know these times. When you're enjoying the presence of God, the, the presence of God, these moments that you cherish, you're troubled, but you still have the strength to go before God. You say, God, I know I am troubled. I know I'm not able to handle this situation, but you remain to be God. You remain to be Yahweh. I will worship you regardless of my situation. These times will come upon those people who have repented. Not people who are harboring sins, not people who are taking advantage of the grace of God. Paul says, should we take his grace for granted? Sin and sin and sin again because his grace is sufficient? No, not at all. We cannot continue to be habitual sinners because His grace is available for us. Repent so that you will experience forgiveness from God. And that He may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. Think about it. He's talking to these people. He say, Christ was preached to you before. <laughs> if you didn't get him in the prophecies, he's been there. He is in there. If you did pay attention, he's always been there. He was preached to you. And Paul tells us in the book of Romans that none of us has excuse. Because in one way or another, we have received his word. Whether by verbal revelation or by the things that we see, God has been preached to us. But it is the condition of our hearts, the hardness of our hearts, that is keeping us away from enjoying the presence of God. Christ was preached to you, he says. Whom heaven must receive until 
the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear, will not hear that prophet, shall be utterly destroyed from amongst the people. If you will not hear that prophet, you will be utterly destroyed. And they, they were like, man, if we don't hear about him right now, if we don't change right now, we are cut off. We are cut off. They understood it because they read it many times. Gee, the, the, every other time, God has always confirmed his word through various events. When Jesus was baptized, God spoke. The voice was heard. Say, this is my only son. Hear him. Don't hear someone else. If they don't bring Jesus to you, don't pay attention to them. Jesus is everywhere in the scripture. Whoever will not will be destroyed. And you take a minute and think, this is the time. If I don't, it is now or never. You'll always speak to people and be like, man, let me go and think about it. I mean, what is there to think about? To think about how you're going to sin extra? <laughs> how you're going to f continue? Kutoa lok? Those who know how to tow a log. You know, when I was a drunk, that is what we did. You get drunk and then in the morning, things are not well. I'll be fresh. <laughs> you gonga the log, you're back. <laughs> you're, you're, it is a vicious cycle. You're drunk every time. You're drunk every time. I was drunk every time. None of you saw me in that state, so it's good. <laughs> I slept on the ditches, Mutaro, Maji, Meni, and Davey. Sometimes I wonder why I didn't die. <laughs> How do you sleep on Mutaro, Maji, Nakupitia, and you didn't die? People die. Or people get sick badly. And season come on in nani. Repent. Hear the message of Jesus Christ. If you don't, you'll be utterly destroyed. He continues to say, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In you, or in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in tearing away every one of you from your iniquity. And that is the whole point, turning people away from the iniquity, the things that are falling in our hearts. You know, the standard that Christ has brought to us is so high. Say, if you look at a woman or a man lustfully, you have committed adultery and you need to be stoned. You need to be killed. The only one who qualifies to do that is Jesus Christ. But because we physically don't have Jesus here, people think, I can just fornicate. And who will see me? Who will stone me at the end of the day? So just sneak, sneak. No one saw me. No one saw me. And you continue in sin, and you continue. The... How do you feel when you're calling on the name of Jesus? 
and you're continuing in that sin. Does it feel great? What is the process? What does, you know, what goes on in your mind when such things are happening? I want to write this check. You know it's not lawful for you to do that. Something fishy in the office where you're employed, but you're saying, nonetheless, our neon, the boss Amanda devolution, Amanda conference. The whole point of God healing this man was to give this man, Peter, an entry point to share the gospel, of which he did a wonderful job explaining the scriptures to them and leaving them with a choice. It, 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 it's here with you. Repent so that your sins will, blot, will be blotted out so that you will experience a freshness. You, you, you think you've known God? Repent of your sin, you will see. <laughs> you will experience the things you've never experienced before. The joy that no man can give. The peace that surpasses human understanding. All these things, they proceed out of the presence of God. And they did this with all confidence and courage, but it landed them into trouble. Let me read for us these few verses here in chapter 4. Now as they spoke to the people, they continued to, spread, to, to preach. The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. <laughs> it was not like, it was not, excuse me. <laughs> they came upon them like an armed robber. They when people saw them, they began giving way, giving way. Like these politicians, you see. So what happened? Man, don't they feel good about themselves? Everyone is getting, you, you're pushed out of the road because Buanamkubwa is coming in town. They're just about to enter. These people, they, they drove in and they came upon them speedily. To arrest them and they got them. They, they, don't, they didn't run. Say, ah, <laughs> Niawa, come. We are not afraid. They were troubled, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection of dead. This is, their, this is their problem. You can, you can teach about Moses. You can do things about other people in the Old Testament. Just don't mention the name of Jesus and resurrection. <laughs> that is a wrong move. And they were ready to face it, whatever came. And they laid hands upon them and put them in Custody until the next day, for it was already evening. You realize, you read the book of Acts, these people, they love the evening times. <laughs> when Messiah Giza. <laughs> people of darkness, they love to do things in the dark. When it's during the day, they fear that the mob will kill them. Towards the evening, it's like, no, if we get them right now, now we have more time because we can't, judge them in the evening time. That is their law. We have to spill it to the next day. And they're like, that's it. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. Think about it. <laughs> One man was healed, and then now we have thousands who are born again. People make the foundation of their ministries to be healing and healing and healing. Trust me, these things they seize here. These people who are healed, even Lazarus, 
are they alive right now? You don't receive healing and automatically you become supernatural that you don't die. These people, they die again. And the sad reality is if they don't accept Jesus Christ as Savior, they go to hell. And they received healing. Oh, I want to see that. I want to see that. The greatest miracle that you can ever experience is a changed heart. From your wayward things. You guys know yourself. I don't want to make your own testimony. I know mine. That is why I wonder many times why I'm alive today and why God has been so gracious to me. He knows the reason why. Maybe. Paul said the things you go through, they are not for you. They are for others. Encouraging us to always share about our lives, our testimonies. They, un- they encourage other people. Pengine kuna kalewa hapa, naonanga hivi tu wawezi wacha. Nilikuwa kalewa. I left. You can left too. It is possible. Only by the blood of the Lamb. Only by him. I want to call the worship team as we wind up. Just for you to think about this call. I know we might say, well, you know, our, our, our setting is different. We are all born again. We'll never make that assumption. These people that the apostle was preaching to, they were members of that church. <laughs> They went into the temple daily to pray. I wonder what they were saying to God. And then many of them now got born again. Their lives became so fresh, so new. That's amazing to me. And also going back a little bit, when Peter is speaking to this Lame guy. He said, silver and gold, I have none. You remember when the 3,000 came, the Bible says, and they sold their properties. They sold their possessions, and they brought everything to the feet of who? of the apostles, and they distributed as people had need. In other words, there was money back in the church. There was. But it was not for this purpose. Do you think they were going hungry? They were not hungry. They had clothing. Though they just living like normal people. They didn't have the liberty to take that money from that gathering, keep a few thousands in their pocket and say, we have people on the streets who have need. We are going to give them, you know, mutu akiulis I give. At the end of the day, it is church's money. Right? We are serving God with this money. He didn't have that liberty to take church's money and give to people. That was a great lesson for me. I don't have any liberty here in this church to take a penny, keep it in my pocket so that when I meet people who are in need, I gave the church's money. That is not being honest. And I think we should learn from that principle. They said, silver and gold we do not have. But such as we have, we give to you. Silver and gold, we don't have to do And also, it is not just now you going to the streets and giving people money carelessly. You have to be very discerning to know how to help people. There are people who have genuine need. There are people who are just scavengers, 
who are looking for things. And some people will say, well, I'm going to take my tithe to the streets. Shame on you. Which Bible told you to do that? Say, bring your tithe into the house of God so that the Bible says so. Pay attention to what the Bible says as opposed to what your feelings are driving you to do. If you want to help people, help them. And if you meet someone on the road there, they're asking for food. Give them food. Don't send them to the church elders. And the pastor at It is our collective responsibility to be a blessing to people. It is not selected that these are the only people who are supposed to give food to other people. Are you not wanting the blessings from God? Bless people, God will bless you. You give to the poor, it's like you've lent it to God. He'll give back to you. But also remember you have a part in your local church to serve God with your finances. The New Testament doesn't talk about the 10%. We have said that many times. But it gives us the opportunity to serve God as much as we are able to. You're not limited. Amen.